There is a light in the core of our being that calls us home, one that can only be seen with closed eyes. We can feel it as a radiance in the center of our chest. This light of loving awareness is always here, regardless of our conditioning. It does not matter how many dark paths we have traveled, or how many wounds we have inflicted or sustained, as we have unknowingly stumbled toward this inner radiance. It does not matter how long we have sleepwalked, seduced by our desires and fears. This call persists until it is answered, until we surrender to who we really are. When we do, we feel ourselves at home wherever we are. A hidden beauty reveals itself in our ordinary life. I think we are here to awaken to who we really are as this open, loving awareness to embody this awareness in an increasingly deep way and to express it in our ordinary lives. In my work with people, I often find that there are almost two opposing forces. One of them wants to awaken, and then the other one is the force that once they finish a practice or they came back home from their retreat and they, ah, oh, it's over, TV on. I can forget again. Yes. How do you see that force, that force that wants to forget about oneself? We are profoundly ambivalent beings, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Right? And it's almost like we have different parts. Yeah. You know, one part seeks comfort, pleasure, and safety. You know, this is our more relative conditioned self. And the other part, which is not a part, which is actually our wholeness, essential wholeness, is quietly calling us home, right? And uh, our attention, our understanding will vacillate between those. And I think it's necessary that it does so. It's like we need to discover the limitations of safety, comfort, and pleasure, and realize something is still missing this is not my deepest happiness. This is good, you know, but there's more to life than that. And then it's also a shift, I would say, between ordinary strategic mind and this deeper knowing or heart wisdom. And we begin to see, in a way, the futility uh, of the search for happiness through the acquisition of objects and understand it's not about that. So for me, it's just part of the process of, of learning and and uh, coming to the dead ends and seeing the limitations of uh, our conventional approach to life. It's beautiful to see that this essential nature is true for everyone, regardless of their conditioning or their background, and that one can contact it directly, free really of any ideology. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the South Bay, in Santa Clara and San Jose, which is now Silicon Valley. But before it was Silicon Valley, it was full of orchards. I was um, an acolyte, an altar boy. I had my special robes on. I would help the, the minister, uh, you know, administer communion and carry the banners around. And, um, until I was about 12 and began to think more on my own and became more um, kind of skeptical, though I liked our minister. Uh, he was a nice man and obviously very ethical. So there was a kind of, I think, a certain ethical standard that was established and a sense of service to the greater community, not just Christian. Uh, so I think those were, I did take with me, a kind of broad-minded Christianity and a service orientation um, as well. There are so many people that are interested in spirituality and they begin developing some relationship to a teacher or a master or a guide and they often see the guide as someone special yeah. you know they were born special they're coming from a special background reincarnation but potentially and I think one of the things we're trying to do is to talk about that yes to kind of give the message that you don't have to be special no. to tap into that absolutely there is this kind of myth of specialness uh, a kind of halo effect around um, teachers and teachings, and I fell for it, you know, big time, uh, which I can now see as transference and 
and actually a projection of my own inherent wholeness and naturalness onto the teacher, you know, or the teaching. I attended UC Santa Cruz, which had just opened a few years before. It was experimental, it was small, it was multidisciplinary. That attracted me. In my freshman year, uh, I had a friend who exposed me to some of the Indian saints, Yogananda, Sri Ramakrishna, and I began to read those biographies. There was something very interesting, something very familiar or resonant about this tradition, and that got me interested in um, starting a meditation practice. Uh, when I was 20, I uh, was initiated into TM in 1970, and I met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 72. I became a teacher in 74. And when I was in, did an advanced uh, six-month course in Switzerland in 76, and I discovered something really interesting, is that this identity was forming around being a yogi and being a saint. It was like, you know, talk about an egoic project. It was like, there it is, you know. So there were two things going on. There was actually an intuitive love for what's essential and true, and then there was an egoic attachment and story that kind of paralleled that process, and of which I was only vaguely aware. I remember recognizing that there was something really special going on with John. I could feel his attunement was so, not just conceptual, but emotional and energetic, where he was sensing what was happening with me and able to use his own sensitivity to enhance my own experience. And what I started to recognize over time was that I have that same sensitivity. I was reviewing our relationship, probably knowing we were coming out here mm -hmm. today, and I was appreciating the mentoring or the teaching that I've gotten from you. Is With many of your students or mentees, there's such a generosity I can feel from you for me or for your students as they mm -hmm. come more into themselves. Mm -hmm. And the generosity is also, there's no sense of how it needs to be done or it needs to be loyal to your teachings. It's actually quite quite the opposite, it's really kind of a, a send-off into like just like be yourself, like really fully flourish. And that's a lovely thing to feel, it's sort of like a kind of like a wind at my back. It deconstructs that separation that so often can exist in the idealization. This is a theme of finding one's inner authority and taking one's seat, which is such a profound process that we, we actually learn to trust our knowing, our deepest knowing, and that becomes our ground. You know, and, and that's so much part of the de-idealization of the teacher. We discover, usually gradually, this authority that mm -hmm. comes from mm -hmm. self-trust. Not, not just trusting the conditioned mind, but trusting a profound silence and deeper knowing. When did you first consciously had an experience of what is essential and true? I knew in my second meditation that I referred to, kind of being able to consciously access the sense of infinite space, that there was something really essential in that. There was a recognition, this is really important. A sense of orienting to a depth that was genuine. And so I became an ardent meditator as a result. Although the way I thought about it at the time, I think was confused because I thought, it, I thought of it as a state to achieve. An understandable mistake. Um, so there was both some clarity and an intuitive recognition that this kind of infinitely spacious awareness was essential, and there was confusion that somehow it was I needed to achieve it, and there was someone to achieve that. Not long after that, um, I took a huge dose of LSD. I went to a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> I knew in a moment that if I tried to resist this experience, I would really suffer. And there was such a momentum, I would call it a transcendental momentum, there was actually a sense that I was dying to everything that I took myself to be. And after a moment of hesitancy, I just let go. It's like, if I am to die now, it's fine. Because there is a sense of opening to something much greater. And this was my first experience of uh, non-dual awareness, because the sense of self completely just collapsed. 
and there was a sense of this radiant infant awareness of which I was in the very center. And it was a profound seeing and knowing of this is true, right? And that I had broken into the sanctuary through a side window <laughs> in a, you know what I mean? Like I hadn't just like entered the front door. I just like, you know, I was like a, what is that? A, you know, like a burglar who'd broken in to the sanctum. And I knew this wasn't my path to use psychedelics. It was very interesting. I was 20 years old and the thought came, this will come to you naturally in another 30 years or so. Of course, it was during the Vietnam War and I was, like many young people, opposed to it and would go to protests. And, and then I got drafted. I felt a tremendous dilemma, you know, and I did file as a CO, conscientious objector. If, if it were World War, World War II and I, were, I was having to fight the Nazis, I would fight, you know. So it was political. Probably for the first time in my life, I prayed to be given a different uh, assignment you know, not on a weapon system. And I can't say who I prayed to, and I don't quite remember what the prayer was, but it's just like, please, you know, if there's some other way of doing this, you know, help me out here. I guess it worked. Next morning, uh, we came back in the hall. Um, my name was called, I came forward, and they said, a strange thing happened last night. Your, uh, your assignment was changed, and you're now an ammunition clerk. As I reflect on my experience, there are a lot of like dreams and visions and kind of inner guidance this way that I can see would pop up at certain times. So I think the earnestness, the yearning that we have is really important to honor, to really listen to that and to give our attention to it. Then I had this really life-changing dream, a lucid dream with um, a uh, sage in India who I didn't know named uh, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj and in the dream I'm in Bombay and I'm outside this little apartment window standing in the street and there is this sage dressed in a very simple white dhoti and he looks at me and his eyes are glowing they are luminous and I look at him and awaken that is to say become aware that it's a lucid dream and that we are in some kind of profound rapport. I don't know who he is, I don't recognize him. And he mentally says to me, will you be my translator? And I mentally say, but I don't know your language. And then he comes out and he takes my arm and he said, you can spend some time with me. And that was the end of the dream. I read this and some kind of light just opened. Again, this is like a glimpse of what's essential. And it's like, I've got this whole seeking thing wrong. Something in me knew, this is true. What I'm looking for, what I'm yearning for, I am already. For several years, I am that became my sort of guiding text. I would sit and meditate, read a little bit, meditate every evening. But it was two years later when um, a friend told me about Jean Klein, a uh, European Advaita master. So he became a deeply trusted teacher for me. I would say, help me orient in a deep way. I didn't realize that there was a meditator identity. You know, a, kind of a, this kind of quiet witness. And it wasn't until I was with Jean that he began to directly point, and the Sagradatta did that as well directly point to the absence of a separate self. That, that the sense of a separate self was a construct, uh, a fabrication, uh, a compelling one, a largely unconscious one, uh, but nonetheless a construct. It's an interesting question to ask, you know, what is it that I don't want to know about myself, right? What is it that I don't want to feel? 
right? This has been part of your kind of emergent teaching too. That's a big part of it, it's true. It's really opening to the unknown, but not just the unknown, which is sort of the, the big space, which is a beautiful opening to that unknown, but opening to what's unknown in this very human incarnation. What's, what's, what's wanting to be known, needing to be known, but also not wanting to be known. Like there's energy around that that, mm -hmm. that, that blocks it. And that's actually, uh, to me, where there's a lot of life that um, I think gets ignored in a lot of spiritual teachings. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I've appreciated about your teachings. It's so embodied. It so includes, you know, the, the heart, the head and the, the hara, as you say, or the, the body and the primi primitive instincts or primal places of, of power and humanity. Yeah, that, and that emptiness, that, that spacious, peaceful space can be just such a sanctuary for a while. It can, you know, just to feel that openness, you know, that freedom can be so compelling. Yeah. But also uh, there can be a fixation. There. Can be, yeah. And it's interesting because when I when I come across teachers or even students in a certain tradition with teachers that emphasize the transcendent but leave out this wholeness that we're talking about, the I literally can feel a certain lack of ground. Like there's a kind of an airy, spacious quality, but it, it lacks a certain kind of intimacy or juiciness or vibrancy that's very human, which to me is so precious. It's so much part of our wholeness and yeah. I, why would we leave that out that's actually well that's an interesting <laughs> question because it's uh, troublesome because it's dangerous because it's unknown because there's shame and fear mm. very shame often. and fear yeah. shame and fear it takes a lot of courage this is where vulnerability this is where honesty uh, are so important this is where the dedication to truth right is central in this this approach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This willingness to not just be comfortable, but to turn toward that which is not so comfortable. John Klein passes away. Mm -hmm. 98. 98. What happens next with you without a teacher now? Without a teacher, and yet I feel like I met my teacher and I'm done with teachers. Okay. I just need to stay with the teaching and let it deepen. And then one of my friends had met Adyashanti, at that time a younger American teacher, now well-known, and said, I think you'd like him. And on the last night of the meeting with Adya, there was a small group kind of in a living room sitting there in Q&A, and this little voice came. And uh, I write about this in the book, so you're familiar with it. But um, And it said, Finish me off. You know, it's like, what voice is that? Never heard this voice before. Finish me off. So I raised my hand, and Ajay, a little voice just came and saying, Finish me off. And Ajay looked at me and he said, What's not finished? And I sat for a little while and I said, I don't know. And then he said, then you're finished. And I looked into his eyes and I saw infinity looking out through them. And a heartbeat later, the infinite was looking out through these eyes, meeting itself. And I woke up in the middle of the night and there's this bad smell. And there had been lightning strikes uh, the night before, this is often the case in the summer in the Sierra, I thought, oh, probably some lightning has hit a nearby tree and it, it's burning. No, that's not a tree. It, was like, it smells like burnt rubber. And then I had this image of a huge pile of tires, like just burning. And I realized, you know, this is in my mind, like almost in my brain, like something was getting burned through. There had been a skylight there for many years, like a lot of light coming through, but some separation. And probably that kind of witness, you know, that kind of separate, subtle sense of self. The skylight had broken and it never reconfigured itself. So the, the sense on the level of the mind, 
a shift had happened. And there was that, that sense, the perfume of the infinite became um, a common experience. And I, six weeks later, the retreat ended and Aji was giving a talk in Palo Alto and there was a break and we chatted a bit. And I said, could this be called a mental awakening? He said, yeah, yeah, you could call it that. And then he said, let what has happened here happen here. You already know something about this. Linda and I met at a transpersonal conference in Asilomar, and we both attended the same workshop on intuition. And it turned out Linda was clairvoyant. She had, um, she had had some near-death experiences. She'd gotten her master's degree from JFK. She was a very intuitive person. And she later told me when she would meet in groups like this, she had a little practice, which was to send a little beam of gold light to each person you know, and just see what would happen. And she said, when it came to me, there was this big explosion. So she got really interested. And we sat, you know, in a kind of um, meditative exercise and immediately dropped in. And we were asked like, you know, uh, just kind of intuit, what is the color that's resonant with this other person? And what, you know, what symbol would come? And, you know, and they were so accurate for each other. We realized, wow, there's this deep attunement. You know, this is completely startling. And, and I had a girlfriend at the time as well. So it's like, what is going on? So um, um, I asked her out, or actually I went over to her place in Sausalito. We had a very deep meeting. Um, I, we had a second meeting a few days later and I asked her to marry me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not my style at all. I and mean, she said, John, there's some things I need to tell you. And uh, she said, I've been given seven years to live. And I don't have any in health insurance. So if you want to retract your offer, feel free, because you didn't know. And uh, so it was a very interesting moment. You know, like, what am I going to listen to here? Because my rational mind was saying, you are insane. This is completely irrational. This is a very bad plan. This will not go well. And my heart was saying, this is my partner. So I eventually got quiet and uh, there was a yes there, not from the mind, but from some deeper knowing. So I came back and I said, yes, yeah, my offer holds. And so um, we got married in the spring and we had six and a half years of marriage that was profound and beautiful and heartbreaking and heart opening. So another kind of remarkable story is when she died, it was like 2 a.m. in the morning and I went to the chaplain's office and just sat quietly. And to my amazement, she came in, in an inner space, not outwardly, no visuals, no inner visuals either, but her presence, I felt her. And she said in a very clear way, do not grieve for me, I am happy to be free of this body. And then this tremendous release of energy up and out through the top of the head, like a rocket ship. It was, it was a kind of another of these, oh my God, experiences. You know, this was maybe, you know, a few minutes after she'd been declared dead. And for two weeks, I was in an altered state, very expanded, almost like, you know, I was, had crossed over a little bit with her in another realm. Very expansive, very peaceful. And then, the, and then that diminished and the grief came. Waves, huge waves of grief and for months. It was really my relationship with Linda that taught me about genuine intimacy and vulnerability. And, and the holes in my own psychology uh, that I was unknowingly trying to fill. I realized when I took your class for the first time, oh, this is the reason I came to San Francisco, to CIIS. This was the, this person is embodying and has a very practical and deep 
understanding and expression of how to integrate psychological work with the depth of being spiritually. That was just truly transformative in terms of how I work. It's informed everything that I do with my client work. But what I didn't really uh, count on that I'm so grateful for was that, oh, this isn't actually a technique of healing. It's really a way of being and a way of living. I love bringing it into and expressing it in you know, all of my relationships. So yeah, I, I, can, I can just feel a tremendous gratitude just because it's, it's just changed my life really, John. You've changed my life in that way. Well, and I've been correspondingly grateful for our friendship and this deep sharing that we have together. So it goes both ways. <laughs> you can tune in to people's gifts and their essence, sometimes even before they can recognize it and you see it and hold it and mirror it and encourage it until they can kind of stand in it fully themselves. There's a lot of things that come together subtly to, to see that, to encourage that, but also to be patient in its unfoldment, but, but also to sometimes uh, nudge or mm -hmm. challenge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone to like, you can do this. Yeah. You can stand on your own feet. You've mm -hmm. got this. Mm -hmm. And it's a very quiet but powerful like I said earlier, uh, like a wind at your back. Like there's a, it's sort of invisible, but very felt. <laughs> to the person who is watching this and is not familiar or doesn't have the experience of this practice, what does it do for a person? What does that do? It gave me a taste of freedom, of essential freedom, and it validated an intuitive sense of knowing this is who I am. Um, there's a sense of homecoming, a sense of ease, a sense of profound connection. When you know yourself not just as this, I'm not going to say we're not this, but not just this, not only this, but of, of something so vast that it's incomprehensible, but sensed and felt and known, our whole orientation to life changes from being fear-based. So it actually facilitates our integrity, our honesty, our authenticity. It facilitates our creativity as a result. Because when we're less bound by how we think we should be, or then we're actually freer to move uh, in a way that's authentic. We're freer to um, pursue relationships that are genuinely resonant and to let go of those that are not. And this brings a whole nother quality of compassion, of generosity, of gratitude, of appreciation, of kindness, and a felt sense of wholeness and communion. Yeah, wholeness here, and then when it really matures, of knowing wholeness everywhere, which is the experience of communion, or oneness, or love or non-duality, non-separateness. And for me, this is really, this is the great pilgrimage, the shift of attention from the head to the heart. It's very different to allow attention to rest in the heart area, to ask a question and then be quiet, right, and just wait. And, and here we're starting to get access a felt sense of what's authentic or true. A felt sense is a whole body sense of something that is prior to a differentiation of thought and feeling and sensation. I was fortunate to have known Christiane through our affiliation with Jean Klein, so we were friends. And there was a sense of resonance there as well. Um, but we were just friends and my love interest was with Linda and when she passed, um, I could just feel that Christiane was my life partner. It was interesting. Uh, but her green card was running out. <laughs> and she had to leave for France and it wasn't clear whether she'd be coming back or not. So this is one of these interesting 
experiences where emotionally I wasn't ready, I was still grieving, you know. Um, uh, a year after Linda's passing, mm -hmm. uh, a little less than a year, but I knew this was my life partner, my next life partner, really. So uh, I followed my intuition, asked Christiane to marry me, she agreed, um, and it felt like for a while I had two partners. It was very, I couldn't be fully available uh, emotionally, but I knew that I would be, you know, it, but it took a few years and we uh, had a son and there was something very heart opening about having a child of your own and just like, you just can't resist loving this little being. And so that cracked through some of my grief, but it's been beautiful because Christiane and I both studied with Sean Klein, she longer than me. She's deeply oriented to um, his understanding and teaching. We share this and many other things. And it's just continued this deepening um, intimate capacity for intimacy and for which I'm very grateful. But I think the most important part is, and this is true whether we are with our own experience or the experience of another, is our availability, our openness uh, to be with what is in this moment. And as simple as that sounds, uh, it's actually quite challenging given the nature of the strategic mind. We anticipate many things that never happen. You know, as Mark Twain once said, I've lived a very long life and I have encountered a great many difficulties, many of which never happened. <laughs> but I think the ultimate resource is really our true nature, our essential nature. This is the deepest, this is the widest, this is the most profound. And the more that we can tap into this, individually and collectively, the more we're able to adapt to difficult circumstances. When I work with people, often we'll start from presence, you know, which may seem abstract if you don't know what that is. Um, but for me, presence is awareness of awareness. We're aware that we are aware, not just aware of our present experience, that's kind of classic, non-judgmental, open attention to the present moment, mindfulness. There's, a, there's still someone being mindful, and it's a shift of attention, not just from present experience or from present experience to awareness itself. It's like we shift attention from, yes, thoughts, feelings, sensations, and then we're noticing we're aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations, and this awareness is always here, recognized or not. The point is to be intimate with our experience. Where do you sense this in your body? Does it localize? What's in the very center of this? This is a very interesting question. You know, from presence, we go into an area of contraction and we inquire, not with the mind, you know, but from a deeper knowing, what's in the very center of this contraction? So for instance, you take an experience of shame, which can be a feeling, there can be a feeling of unworthiness. Often, not only, we can feel it in our face and our guts, but often localizes most intensely in the heart area, you know, and we begin to tolerate it. You know, we begin to accept it. We begin to feel into it. And then we find kind of what's behind the shame, which is innocence. It's very beautiful. So here, our shame, is our portal to our innocence. And it's, it's just, then that comes into the system, that discovery. It feels like that which is unconscious wants to be conscious. It's a process, if we would use that kind of theistic language of God awakening, you know, and why? I don't know. I'm rather clueless on this point, but it doesn't feel actually important to answer that or try to answer that. Uh, one can come to some philosophic position. Uh, really what does feel important is to give oneself to this opening that we're all invited to. Uh, there is a yearning we all have to uh, recognize our deepest sense of self and to bring that forward into our ordinary life. To me, this is what's important. 
This, this feels alive, this feels authentic, this feels connected, this feels in service to uh, something profound and beautiful.